Good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. M. Ramakrishnan. I am a senior consultant in critical care and sleep medicine at Apollo Hospitals in Chennai. Today, I just wanted to talk about what really happens inside an ICU. And this is meant for the non-medical uh, people. Just to outline on some common terminologies that are often used in general, and particularly during the COVID uh, pandemic, where there are a lot of worries, concerns, uh, you know, uh, issues that people think are happening inside the ICU. So the session is aimed to clarify some of those uh, questions. First of all, how do we recognize COVID-19? I know there has been a lot of talk about this in the media and you know, to the extent that people are concerned about any symptom being COVID, the common symptoms that people present with COVID-19 are number one, cough and sore throat, fever, and a feeling of generalized body ache and fatigue. Those are the very common symptoms, particularly those who are having mild symptoms only have these symptoms. Those who have moderate and severe symptoms are likely to have particularly breathlessness, feeling, you know, uh, a sense of uh, breathlessness when they are moving, walking, or even when they are at rest could be the most common worrying symptoms in those with moderate or severe COVID-19 infection. Of these, when you are feeling unwell, Broadly, we categorize people as low risk and high risk. And who are the people at low risk? Those who are under the age of 60 without having any underlying health conditions, what we call as comorbidities. The common comorbidities that we think about are those who have high blood pressure, those who have diabetes, those who have heart disease or have underlying cancer, which they have been treated for, or anybody whose body's immunity is suppressed due to some rheumatological problems like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or those who have undergone transplant. Any of these people are at higher risk. So if you're over 60 or have any of these comorbidities, then you're at higher risk of possibly having a moderate or severe infection and therefore need to get quick attention. If you fall in the low risk category, if you're below 60 and don't have any of these comorbidities, then you are likely to have mild symptoms and you are likely to have a mild COVID-19 infection and need to be reassured that a lot of the times you could probably be managed at home. Of all the people who are having COVID-19 infection, four or five people will experience mild or moderate symptoms. By this I mean almost about 80% of the people may have mild or moderate symptoms that may not even require hospitalization, which is why, you know, we are talking a lot about home quarantining. We are talking a lot about COVID care centers that are not really hospitals, but can take care of these patients, particularly to isolate themselves, monitor them remotely, and if necessary, transfer them to a higher level of care. Around 95% of people who have been sick with COVID-19 to date have recovered or are recovering. As you can see, the recovery rate is very high in several countries and also in our country and each state there may be a little difference. I'm not here to talk about numbers, but I do want to gen generalize and this is a slide that I've borrowed from the World Health Organization where we are noticing that a lot of people recover completely and get back to their routine. And that's what needs to be understood and felt uh, reassured. Another reassuring fact is the fact that children and adolescents have been far less affected by COVID-19 and their symptoms often have been mild. This has been true of many countries, including India. In fact, the first few months, there weren't many pediatric or uh, pediatric cases or children being affected. Of course, we are now seeing a few. But overall, the number of children affected is much, much less than adults. While COVID-19 is often mild, 
it does spread rapidly and very quickly and that is why we are always worried about the spread of disease to others which is why all the precautions need to be taken properly and we will need to work together to protect those who are most vulnerable we have to protect ourselves and also those who are most vulnerable and those who are most vulnerable are number one healthcare workers particularly when we are exposed to so many people who have the disease people who are over the age of 60 and those who have underlying health condition or what we often refer to as comorbidities how do you protect yourself and others from covid-19 you can see in this and hearing this a lot but i don't think you can hear it enough uh, despite having all the announcements public health announcements i do see a lot of people not strictly adhering to these when we are seeing them outside or even inside a hospital so remember number one washing your hands frequently with soap and water or an alcohol based rub several times a day is absolutely important because it is likely that if you are touching something that probably has the virus or you know where which could spread the infection and if you touch your nose or your mouth the chances of getting infected is much higher and therefore washing the hands frequently the hand hygiene or hand washing is one of the most important things that we have been uh, emphasizing significantly ever since we have been talking about the covid-19 pandemic if anybody is coughing or sneeze, sneezing you need to cover your mouth with what we call it bent elbow so cover your mouth cover your nose whenever you are sneezing and as i said wash the hands after your coughing or sneezing episode and also frequently as i have already mentioned most importantly avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth often because that is how the chances of spreading the infection or getting the infection increases keeping a distance at least about 1 million 1 meter distance from others what is often being referred to as social distancing or physical distancing is absolutely important because the chances of spreading the droplets or the infection that far is significantly lowered and therefore whenever you are out you know shopping or in, you know even in a group of a few people it's important that you maintain that distance in any meeting so that you can reduce your uh, chances of getting infected we talked about who is low risk we talked about who is high risk once again to reiterate age is one factor age below 60 is thought to be low risk age above 60 is thought to be more risk secondly the comorbidities which we talked about high blood pressure diabetes heart disease cancer uh, you know prior history of any immunity suppression which could be you know like rheumatological disorders like rheumatoid arthritis lupus erythematosus uh, systemic lupus erythematosus those who are on steroids those who have had transplant anybody whose immunity is likely to be lower is at higher risk but remember that low risk does not mean no risk so it is absolutely inappropriate for young people to be walking around without following any precautions assuming that the chances of them getting is low remember low risk does not mean no risk so you really need to take the precautions to prevent yourself from getting the problem and also spreading the disease to others who may be at risk with that background i just wanted to talk about icu and what happens inside an icu once again reemphasizing the fact that of all the people who are getting the covid-19 infections about 80% of them are likely to have mild or moderate infection may not even come into a hospital of the remaining 20% who are coming into the hospital not everybody needs to be inside the icu there are several people who are inside the hospital managed in what we call isolation units they may be in single rooms or they may be cohorted with others who have positive covid-19 infection so it is possible that they may be cohorted there are precautions taken when in isolation whether it is uh, um, you know using uh, air purifiers or negative pressure rooms are used so that the chances of spreading the infection is less and all 
the healthcare professionals who manage those patients will also be taking the appropriate precautions using the personal protective equipment to prevent the spread of infection and also prevent themselves from getting the infection. As I already mentioned, healthcare professionals are at very high risk of developing the infection if we don't use the appropriate personal protective equipment. This is our critical care unit. Again, you will hear different terms. Some people call it ICU, intensive care unit. Some people call it CCU, critical care unit. Some hospitals have designated special care units. Like for example, they may have a cardiac care unit or a coronary care unit. They may have a separate intensive care unit. They may have specialized unit like a neurosurgical ICU, which is only for people who are undergoing you know, brain and spine surgery or neurosurgery or trauma patients. They may have a cardiothoracic ICU, which is specifically for patients who have undergone cardiothoracic surgeries like bypass surgery or any lung surgery, and they may be managed there. They may have a transplant ICU. So there are different specialty ICUs. So each hospital may be different. Each hospital may use different terms. So, you know, sometimes people get confused. Oh, they said CCU. Does that mean coronary care? Does that mean cardiac care? So as I said, some hospitals call it critical care unit, including our own hospital where we call it MDCCU or multidisciplinary critical care unit where different kinds of patients who need critical care are admitted. And that could include people who are post-operative, people who have trauma, people who have overdose, people who have lung problems, people who have what we call respiratory failure requiring a ventilator. So any of these patients could come into the multidisciplinary critical care unit. And as you can see, this is how our multidisciplinary critical care unit looks. You might find different types of units in different hospitals. Uh, some may have doors, some, as you can see, ours each unit bed is covered with a glass door. Some may just be separated by curtain. So you may see different kinds of intensive care unit. At this time, I think it's also important for me to clarify the difference between emergency department and intensive care unit or emergency room, sometimes call it or casualty, which is very different than an intensive care unit. When anybody comes with any emergency, it could be chest pain, it could be somebody having trouble breathing, it could be somebody having uh, accident, any of them first come into the emergency department or what is referred to as ED, emergency department or ER, emergency room or casualty or accident and emergency. These are all different terms that are used for the same unit where they first come to the emergency department and depending on what is found and what is necessary sometimes you know like patients may get uh, discharged after being evaluated in the emergency room uh, you know if they don't require hospitalization they get evaluated they get treated for example it could be a small wound that requires suturing and they may be sent home somebody may come with a chest pain that is thought to be just acidity and they may get some medications and get sent home or they may get admitted to the hospital and once they get admitted to the hospital they can get admitted to a hospital ward or sometimes called a hospital floor in a room and these rooms could be single rooms double rooms whatever it is or if the problem is severe enough requiring close monitoring if they require monitoring then they would probably get admitted into an appropriate intensive care unit or critical care unit which is what this is so when you see an intensive care unit, a lot of people question, you know, ICU is a very what we call technology intense environment. You would see a lot of different equipments there, which could be confusing, some of which could be alarming, some of which could show numbers about which you are concerned, saying, oh, you know what, it is showing as a number is low, is the oxygen level low, or is it, and it can be very scary or intimidating for non-medical people to walk into an ICU, see all this equipment, see numbers that are not looking normal, see alarms going and it can be as I said very scary or intimidating to several people which is why I just wanted to show you some of the common equipments that you may see in an intensive care unit and the terminologies that we use so that when you uh, see someone there you understand and then ask always the appropriate questions to the doctors uh, to explain further so this is our typical critical care unit bed where you can see that you know there are uh, the most important one is you will see the monitor and the monitor usually displays um, the heart rate the blood pressure 
the temperature and how a patient is breathing. These are the common what we call vital signs or parameters that are monitored in most intensive care units. Of course, there are also some other what we call invasive monitoring that can be done. If somebody has uh, you know, very low blood pressure and we want to monitor their blood pressure continuously, then they may have what is called an arterial line, a small catheter that is placed inside an artery, either in the wrist or in the groin usually, and then connecting to the monitor and it could show you a continuous blood pressure and that's what we call an arterial line tracing. Sometimes they could have what is called a central line monitoring or central venous monitoring. They may have a venous catheter that is placed either in the neck or in the groin or under the collarbone typically. These are the usual locations where it is placed and that catheter is used for you know, giving medications, you know, drawing blood if required, but also if required, we can monitor how somebody's what we call central venous pressure is and it can give us an idea on whether the patient needs more fluids and other things and that's what it is being monitored for. I don't want to go into the details, but the reason I'm mentioning that is you could see several things displayed on a monitor and the hospital doctors and nurses have the ability to adjust the parameters on the monitor so that alarms could go off whenever it is beyond the normal limits and then we can react to that appropriately. There may also be something called a central monitor where we can centrally connect all these patients and have a view of their heart rate and blood pressure and how it is and if there is a change in the trend we can react immediately. The next one you see there are pumps. By pumps, what I mean is like whenever we have to give medications through the vein, we may have to give it at a particular rate and to give that accurately, you can use these pumps that can deliver it exactly how we want it to be delivered. You may see ventilators and you will see different models and makes of ventilator. Each one may look different. This one almost looks close to how the monitor looks, but I will show you some other pictures where you will see that the ventilator looks different. I intentionally wanted to focus and place a hand rub there, which is part of every ICU bed in our critical care unit, usually placed at the foot end of the bed, which I will show you again when there are patients. Uh, but this hand rub is what we use for the hand hygiene. I told you that we need to uh, clean our hands regularly and frequently and every doctor, nurse or any paramedical professional who is walking into a critical care unit to see a patient should use the hand rub before and after touching the patient, before and after seeing the patient. And we also highly recommend if there are any uh, visitors who are coming in to see the patient, they should also be using the hand rub to maintain hand hygiene or cleanliness of the hand. So this is how it would look when you have a patient in the intensive care unit. As I said, it may look intense, but you can see that the monitor is now displaying several tracings that will give us an idea on the heart rate or the blood pressure or the respiratory rate or even more invasive data as I was just talking about. You can see there are so many different pumps. Some are delivering medications through the vein and there's also what we call a feeding pump. This is just on top of the computer. You see a small pump that is blue and yellow and that's a feeding pump where when we are feeding through a tube into the stomach, we can give it through this feeding pump so that we can ensure that appropriate quantity is delivered on an ongoing continuous uh, fashion. And there are several other equipments without going into further details. This is how normally our critical care unit rounds would happen where we see the patients, we interact with the nurse and we call this a multidisciplinary critical care team or a multidisciplinary critical care rounds where it is not just the doctor, not just the nurse who is involved in taking care of the patients, but several others who care for the patient, including physiotherapists, you know, clinical dietitian, a clinical pharmacist, so that we look through the medication and make sure that everything is appropriate as far as the doses, making sure there's no, uh, you know, interaction between the different medications that we are using. Because sometimes these patients could be on several medications, and we need to ensure that they are all compatible. So this is how our rounds would happen to typically in the mornings. Uh, where we interact with all of them and then come up with a plan and then talk to the family. I now want to highlight with respect to COVID, some of the terms that are often used, which 
to us may look simple, but several people have common questions when these terms are used. And I just wanted to show some of these equipments and therapies, how they are actually done. To start with oxygen therapy, and I told you earlier that every patient who comes into the hospital need not be in an ICU. They may just be in an isolation room. Sometimes even while in the isolation room, if they are having trouble with breathing or if their oxygen level falls down and the way we recognize that is by using what is called a pulse oximetry. The pulse oximetry is a probe that is on the finger that can reflect a number and the number is usually in a percentage and we expect that the oxygen saturation should be more than 93 percent usually and if it is below that sometimes you may need to give them what we call supplemental oxygen. The air around us contains 21 percent oxygen. Now that may not be sufficient for the body in conditions where the lung is affected as in the COVID-19 situation, which is typically what we call a viral pneumonia. It is a virus causing a pneumonia. So when the oxygen level is low, we may give additional oxygen and the way it is given is it can be given through what's called a nasal cannula. You can see from the first picture that it almost looks like a small tube and it is placed right under the nostrils and the oxygen is delivered through that and most of the hospitals may have oxygen supply that's to you looking like it is just coming from the wall and it is based on you know oxygen connections that are available in different parts of the hospital. In some hospitals, the oxygen therapy uh, may be available only in intensive care units and while in the ward they may use some other uh, you know like oxygen cylinders or what we call oxygen concentrators can all be used even at home sometimes oxygen concentrators are used for people with long-standing lung problems and usually delivered through this nasal cannula. Now when I say nasal cannula there's a certain level of oxygen you can give and we describe that as two liters or three liters per minute or four liters per minute, but beyond a certain level you cannot give through the nasal cannula and then we may use what is called a oxygen mask, which in scientific terms is referred as Venturi mask uh, with what we call uh, you know, phys physics principle as Venturi effect. The oxygen is delivered through the mask. So you can see that the nasal cannula is placed just in the nostrils, whereas the oxygen mask fits over your nose and the mouth and that's what we call as a oxygen mask or a venturi mask. Now sometimes patients may need a higher level of oxygen even more than what you can just deliver through an oxygen mask and we now use a device called high flow nasal cannula. This has been out uh, only for the past few years and probably a lot of you have been reading uh, even in the newspapers that there is more and more use of this high flow nasal cannula in the COVID-19 situation. So this is how a high flow nasal cannula looks. You can see that it is also fitting in the nostril, but you can see that probably the cannula now looks a little thicker than the you know, typical uh, nasal cannula or what I should refer to as a low flow nasal cannula looks. And this is connected to a machine through which it delivers a higher flow. Whereas in a low flow nasal cannula or a, what we generally refer just as a nasal cannula, you might be able to deliver about six liters maximum, about eight or 10 liters. Here you can deliver up to 50 to 60 liters without causing any significant problem. And that is how this device has been useful in a lot of these COVID patients to transition them or you know, provide them a higher level of oxygen therapy without having to place them on a ventilator or any other uh, invasive device about which we will talk more. Uh, it is also there was some concern about what we call aerosolization you know like where you know like when we use therapies such as non-invasive masks which i will show you next there was a concern that there could be aerosols that are dispersed and that could probably be more infective to others but the high flow nasal cannula was thought to be less of an issue with that and therefore it has caught on significantly while managing patients with COVID-19 if they are requiring a higher level of oxygen therapy. I keep repeating that so that you know not everybody needs high flow nasal cannula. This is a medical decision that is taken. If somebody requires oxygen, how do you deliver the oxygen? Do they require 
such a small amount that you can deliver with a nasal cannula do they require a little more which we can uh, you know uh, deliver through an oxygen mask sometimes what we call a non rebreather mask or do they need much higher which is now delivered through this high flow nasal cannula the other therapy that you often hear about different terms are used what is called non invasive ventilation as the term suggests there is no tube that is placed invasively nothing goes into your system it is not invasive how it is done is there is a mask that is a tight mask that is placed usually covering your nose and your mouth and you know like uh, a band which is like a velcro uh, gear is there to hold the mask tightly in position and this tight mask is then connected to either a small machine what we refer to as a bipap or bi level positive airway pressure or we can even use a regular ventilator but deliver through this non invasive mask so what the term non invasive suggests is that we are not putting any tube inside the body but we are ventilating this patient when i say ventilating we are able to support how they are breathing and we are able to support the level of oxygen that they are required okay so this non invasive ventilation as i said can be used either with a small machine what we refer to as a bipap or can be connected to a typical icu ventilator which you see on the right side here this is a ventilator now another term that you might hear often in uh, patients who are being treated with covid-19 infection is awake proning okay so this is something that we find has been useful in some patients to clarify that i just wanted to mention what these terms are supine position is when you lie on your back that is what we call supine position if you lie on your stomach then we call it prone position and this can be done when people are awake or even when they are sedated and on a ventilator which we will talk more and making a patient prone seems to help the lung mechanics and improve the oxygen level in general in patients who have lung injury whether it is related to pneumonia or any other reason and in the covid-19 situation covid-19 viral pneumonia this has been a strategy that a lot of people are using to see whether we can improve the oxygenation without having to place somebody on a ventilator these are some other positions which is called right lateral when you right lie on your right side that is called a right lateral if you lie on the left side it is called left lateral if you are lying with your head down and the leg up position that's called trendelenburg and if you are having your head of the bed elevated with your leg straight that's called the fowler's position i don't want to go into details of all of these but i brought this mainly to highlight the fact that lying on the stomach the prone position is used as a strategy in patients who are being treated for covid-19 pneumonia this is what we describe as an awake proning so you can see here the patient is awake wearing a mask uh, requiring a little oxygen but you know covered with a mask over that and then he is prone by that i mean you are requesting the patient to say lie down on your stomach because it will improve your oxygen level some people find it easy some people find it difficult we keep changing the position it's not like you have to be in that position always but being in that position for some time changes the way your lung expands what we describe as lung mechanics and seems to improve the oxygen level so here you one is actually uh, just a healthy volunteer who just uh, post for the picture but he, here you can also see a patient who was willing to do the proning uh, he was awake and he was being monitored and he turned and was lying on his stomach to improve the oxygen level this awake proning can be done while the patient is having a high flow nasal cannula or any other oxygen cannula or a mask as you can see in the picture on the left and you can also do it when a patient is on non invasive ventilation maybe a little bit more difficult because your face turns to the one side because when you are completely flat 
you might find it very difficult uh, to wear the mask as well. But this is something that the doctors and the nurses would explain to you. And it seems to help and it's a simple strategy without having to do anything else invasively or significant. And it's been found to be useful in some selective patients who are requiring hospitalization, who are required to be monitored closely in the ICU. I used this term earlier, intubation, which is basically a tube that is placed through your mouth into the throat or what we call the trachea. This is the windpipe that you're seeing here. So the tube is placed there and then connected to a ventilator. So the air and the pressure and whatever we are delivering through the mechanical ventilation is through this endotracheal tube into your lung and that is how it works and when we do this intubation as a procedure in general we take precautions but now with the covid 19 pandemic this is one situation where the healthcare workers are at very high risk of getting the disease if they are not protecting themselves with appropriate personal protective equipment so we need to ensure that they wear all this what we call PPE or personal protective equipment, literally covering their head, you know, using a face shield mask, using what we call an N95 mask that prevents, you know, air, um, respiratory droplets and aerosols, you know, like um, affecting them, covering the entire body either with what we call a jumpsuit or here the person is wearing a surgical gown and also something to cover the neck using appropriate you know like gloves all of these are essential and extra precautions are taken by covering the patient with an appropriate sheet and then doing the procedure so that you minimize the risk of the healthcare providers getting an infection so even though the procedure can be emergent a lot of the times getting ready for the procedure takes a few seconds to a minute so that the person who does the procedure is also appropriately protected. This is how patients on ventilator might look when you're seeing and as you can see the uh, healthcare providers who are caring for these patients also need to be using appropriate personal protective equipment every time they manage the patient. It is not easy for healthcare providers to be always covered throughout because it can be suffocating, it can be sultry, and even if they have to take a break or use the restroom or have to eat, they have to completely remove all this in an appropriate way. This is called donning is when you're wearing it, doffing when you're removing it. It has to be done and these have to be disposed appropriately before they step out and then you know have a break. So it is extremely difficult, particularly when they have to be with the patient for several hours, our nurses and doctors, and every time they go in and out, they'll have to change. And it can be a significant uh, issue or problem when people work long hours taking care of the COVID patients. Patients who go on a ventilator doesn't mean that they don't come off the ventilator, which is why I'm highlighting the other picture on the right, where you can see that the patients do recover, come off the ventilator during this time, or any of the patients who with the COVID infection need any kind of procedure. This was a tracheostomy, but any kind of procedure, they need to be draped, covered, and every healthcare professional needs to use appropriate personal protective equipment for them to uh, you know, do the procedures without causing any infection to themselves or you know, spreading to others. Patients who get admitted to the ICU may just require oxygen therapy, as I described, in different forms, either a nasal cannula or you know, like um, a mask or a high flow nasal cannula, or they may require ventilation either non-invasively or invasively. But after they come off this, which is quite a large number, it is not that people who come into the ICU don't make it out of the ICU. Overall, mortality of all patients in ICU is throughout the world is about 30 to 40 percent. I'm telling about all patients with all kinds of diseases that come into the ICU, which means the chances of somebody making it out of the ICU is much more than them not making it out of the ICU. The reason I'm emphasizing this over and over again is people think that going into the ICU means they may not come out alive, which is completely not true. 
once they have recovered from their illness, once they're off the ventilator, off the oxygen, they get rehabilitated. You know, when I say rehabilitation, getting them out of bed. When you are in bed for a long time, particularly with a severe illness, your body becomes weak, requires the muscles to get back the strength, which may take a long time. So with the assistance of physiotherapy, giving appropriate nutrition and all of those kind of support, patients are gradually mobilized, getting out of the bed, sitting outside the bed, you know, and then gradually beginning to walk, either requiring assistance with a walker or any other device. Um, and all of those are done during this rehabilitation process and gradually the patients get ready to go home, which is, as I said, much more likely to happen than people succumbing to the illness in the hospital. And I repeat that over and over again. And when they are ready, they get to go home. Um, as you can see from this, it is important with the COVID-19 that even after going home, it is important to follow all the precautions that we have emphasized over and over again. It is still unclear because this is a new kind of a problem. We have dealt with several viral pneumonias in the past. We have dealt with swine flu. We have dealt with what we call MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, respiratory virus illness that we had. We had the SARS and we have learned about it over the years. Similarly here, this is a new problem. We don't know if patients who have had an infection with COVID-19 once will completely recover and never have it again or they are likely to have it again. We do not really know and it is important to follow all the precautions at all times even after going home and you know like following up with your doctor because there are people who report you know fatigue, generalized weakness much after going home although they are completely uh, recovered otherwise they feel that they are muscle strength is not as you know back to their usual fatigue seems to persist a longer time a lot of patients in the icu can have what we call post icu syndrome where you know like they could have problems with their physical health you know particularly this being a lung problem a pneumonia it could lead some residual damage to the lung so they need to be monitored closely by their doctors or a lung specialist as it is appropriate they may need to require some continued you know, appropriate nutrition support, appropriate you know, physiotherapy. All of those may need to be followed regularly so that you can uh, optimize your recovery from the illness. I will stop there, uh, but I'm happy to take some questions through the chat box. Okay, uh, please type in your questions in the chat box and I will try to take most if not all of them in the remaining time we have. Okay, here goes the first question that reads, uh, here in many places without any symptoms, not even a fever or a cough, some patients diagnosed with corona at la in the last minute of their life. Same time, in some other places, even they diagnosed with severe infections and breathing issues, they recovered immediately. At every nook and corner, this corona plays differently. We might as it is because of mutation, like the way media says, but don't know the actual situation. Uh, doctors and patients face, can you please brief on this? Okay, I mean, um, first of all, I want to emphasize the fact that this is a new disease, you know, like we are learning about it every day. What I could have told you one month back about coronavirus or COVID-19 infection is very different than what I will tell today. And what I will tell next week may be different from what I'm saying today. So we are learning about the disease. We are learning about the treatment. What we thought worked did not work. What we thought we may not work seems to work. So it is an evolving knowledge. So I cannot say for sure. Yes, it is true 
any disease for that matter can manifest differently in different people forget between different countries even in the same country people may react differently to different diseases the same viral pneumonia can be very severe in some can be very mild in some so it all depends on the body constitution body immunity and several things and can it be because of mutation of this it is possible but that is not something we can control so my request to the person who wrote this message is yes there is a difference in how people may um, get the disease it could be mild moderate severe uh, within the same country between different countries there could be a lot of differences the idea is identify them as soon as possible provide the appropriate therapy not everybody needs to be hospitalized but provide them the appropriate treatment and then manage them is what i would uh, recommend Okay. What type of treatment is done in ICU if patient is in a very critical condition? Okay, so the answer to that is a lot depends on, um, you know, how severe it is. I showed you the different therapies. Yes, we can just give them oxygen. We may give them the oxygen through a high flow nasal cannula, or if their breathing becomes more and more difficult, we may try the non-invasive ventilation. They may. Uh, you know also require ventilator support so the idea is supporting the lung it is a pneumonia it mainly affects the lung and therefore we first support it now any infection when it becomes severe not necessarily covid 19 any infection not necessarily viral infection it could be bacterial infection when it becomes severe what happens is there are a lot of changes that happen in the blood there is a release of certain chemicals what we call cytokines uh you know like which can cause harm to several organs in the body mainly because it drops the blood pressure the blood flow to the entire body may be affected because of the severity of the infection and the release of these several what we call bad hormones or bad chemicals what we call cytokines inflammatory chemicals is what we call them it's a knowledge in evolution you know we don't want to we want to balance what we call inflammation and you know the counter Uh, anti-inflammatory hormones that our body tries to secrete to fight this infection so it's always in, in, important to maintain this balance and the way we do that is by giving certain medications and that has evolved over the last several months initially some uh, medications such as hydroxychloroquine were being evaluated and then it was subsequently shown that it is not of much value there are some antiviral drugs not antibiotics let me say that antibiotics is for bacteria there are some antiviral drugs that have been studied you know you have been hearing about remdesivir you know like lopinavir and all there are so many different medications that have been tried we right now go by what is the accepted protocol what has been proven to be of value is what needs to be used if a patient gets very sick if they are requiring oxygen if they are requiring ventilation one of the treatments that has been shown to be of benefit is steroids using the steroids at the right dose at the right time there are several other unexplored unproven therapy people are talking about plasma therapy you know people are talking about some other you know like uh, ways of removing these cytokines all these are being thought about not yet proven so it is important that while trying is okay it needs to be done through research trials to see what would help the most that's the best way to get randomized to what is appropriate therapy um and use what has been proven to be of value getting panic often public is when we get feel uh, difficulty in breathing yes and then um giving oxygen support and then recovery is crucial and we need to ventilate a support um let me reiterate if you or anybody you know has fever cough sore throat and feels breathless it is important for them to go into a hospital okay so the breathlessness is an indication that you may not be getting enough oxygen checking your oxygen level if necessary getting admitted to the hospital early and giving that or getting that supplemental oxygen and more importantly being closely monitored so that if there is any change or deterioration in the condition you need to get the appropriate treatment as decided by the doctors and nurses who will talk to you and your family i will leave that broad because i don't want anybody to think that 
just because I'm breathless, I'm going to go on a ventilator. It may not happen. Just because, you know, like I'm breathless, uh, I may be tried on these different medications, which may or may not help. I think it's important to trust the doctors, trust the healthcare system, you know, present to the hospitals early, either through a fever clinic or directly going and meeting one of your doctors and then planning the appropriate therapy. Please don't think about everything and then delay presenting to the hospital. I think once again, somebody has mentioned the fact that uh, there is a fear that if they go on a ventilator, they may not come out. Please take that fear out. That is not true. And I've said that several times when I spoke uh, during my lecture. Again, people have asked what type of treatment in ICU patient is severely ill. And I've mentioned that several times. How does ventilator help when the patient has breathlessness and what will happen if the patient is on a ventilator for more than 10 days? That's a good question. You know, like how long somebody would require ventilation, we do not know. What the ventilator does is one, it gives oxygen. Number two, it supports the breathing or what we call ventilation. That is how the machine works. So we, uh, the machine kind of helps for the person to breathe and also get adequate oxygen. Now, once they go on a ventilator, they may require it for a period of time after which we do what is called weaning. We try to get them off the ventilator. If they are unable to get off the ventilator, then we may talk to the families and do a procedure called tracheostomy. What tracheostomy is, I told you about the tube or the endotracheal tube that goes through the mouth into the windpipe. If somebody requires ventilation for a long time, usually two or three weeks or more, then we may plan what is called a tracheostomy where you make a hole directly into the windpipe and then connect them on the ventilator. There are several advantages uh, to this because if the patient is ready to come off the ventilator, we can disconnect from the tracheostomy and check whether they are breathing normally with the comfort that they still have this tracheostomy where they will not block their airway or you know like they continue to breathe. So this is something that we can discuss with the family when the time is right, uh, if they are requiring ventilation for a long time. When ventilator is recommended than using BiPAP, that is a clinical decision as I mentioned. Uh, if the patient has to be awake and alert and cooperative when you are using the non-invasive ventilation or the BiPAP. If they are unconscious, if they are unresponsive, we should not be trying BiPAP. You need to ensure that their air passage is protected because if they collapse and close their air passage, it can be a problem when they are unresponsive. So patient has to be alert when we are using uh, BiPAP. Also, if a patient is unstable from a blood pressure standpoint, if their blood pressure is very low, then we won't usually keep them on BiPAP for too long. We may need to place them on a ventilator. There are questions about immune boosting medications. I will pass that only because that has not got anything to do with the ICU level of care. There are, it is important that you know, like you eat healthy food. That's the most important thing when you want to maintain a good immunity. People have asked several questions relating to vitamin C, vitamin C, zinc. Again, you know, like uh, it certainly is no harm taking them for a period of time. So if necessary and if prescribed by your doctor, please do take it appropriately. Uh, there is a doctor who has asked about um, when a patient goes on a ventilator, what is the recovery rate? In general, you know, if you talk about all patients who are coming into the ICU and that could include any infection, any trauma, any heart disease, any of those, usually the recovery rate is about 70%. By that I mean of 100 people who come in, 70 people would get off the ventilator and go home. Another 30% may succumb. In COVID-19, it is higher um, globally all over the world. There is a if somebody is severe enough to go on a ventilator with COVID-19 infection, their uh, chances of recovery is reduced to about anywhere from 30 to 40%. So the overall mortality in COVID-19 patients on a ventilator anywhere in the world is about 60 to 70%. What precautions to be taken if the patient is a diabetic? Of course, you know, controlling your diabetes is the most important thing because 
poorly controlled diabetes is what reduces your immunity. Um, I'm glad somebody mentioned that because now the fear of COVID, all of us are repeatedly thinking about COVID and forgetting several of our what we call chronic diseases, mainly controlling our blood pressure, controlling our diabetes, controlling our you know heart disease. So uh, there are different options that are given for you to follow up with your doctors. Now there's a lot of telemedicine that is being used where you can remotely talk to your doctors, ensure that you don't miss your medications. I mean, I also practice sleep medicine and I notice that several of my patients are worried because they're not able to sleep or, you know, like they are, are not able to get medications without prescription. So we are available to them through telemedicine. Do not ignore your long standing illnesses because it's absolutely important to focus on those and keep those under control. That itself will help with your immunity and reduce the chances of severe um, COVID disease. What is the use of prone uh, ventilation? I just uh, described the way, you know, like when we are sitting, when we are lying, the way our lung is positioned and how it is expands is different. So what has been found is when you have what we call lung injury with any disease, what we call acute lung injury, uh, whether it's a viral illness or due to any other condition, when we change the body position to prone, when we are lying on our chest rather than on our back, the way our lung expands seems to be better and helping the oxygen level in some people, not all. So some may be sensitive to the prone and some who are not, but it is a simple enough thing to try that may be of a lot of value and that is the reason it is being recommended. We hear many people who are admitted in ICU with different reason of illness by end getting infected with COVID-19 in ICU um, or is it the same for ICU of all health issues? Okay, let me clarify this. Okay. Most hospitals will have a COVID designated ICU. We do not mix people who have COVID and those who don't have COVID as much as possible. Now, sometimes you may be in for a surprise where you admit a patient for completely some other problem. Let's say even a motor vehicle accident. They may come with a trauma and then they may turn COVID positive. They may initially be in a non-COVID ICU, but they may become positive. That is not in our control, but as much as possible when we are suspecting COVID or when we are treating COVID, we place them in our designated COVID ICU that has got all the necessary precautions, including, you know, a negative uh, uh, pressure, a uh, room, HEPA filters to purify the air, you know, whatever is necessary is being done. And personally, today inside a hospital, we recommend to all healthcare workers, considering the level of this pandemic and the number of people who are getting infected, I think it's important to assume that everybody is COVID positive and protect yourself appropriately. And this is the advice I would give to every single healthcare professional. In fact, several uh, of our guidelines have changed, including visiting policy in our ICU, where we used to allow people to freely come into the ICU, see patient families, patients at designated time. Now we are increasingly restricting visiting hours and visitation. Uh, in fact, there is no visitation inside the COVID units to prevent this from uh, you know, infecting others, uh, particularly the visitors. We are trying to see if we can connect people through video and allow them to see their dear ones. All this is a change and this is something that we have to go with the flow. We are learning about the disease every day and we are trying to take every single precaution possible to protect both the healthcare workers, the patients and their family in uh, spreading and making this problem worse. the fact that sufficient beds are not available uh, is it better to buy an oxygen cylinder as a preventive measure if yes which one do you recommend i would absolutely not recommend anybody just keeping an oxygen cylinder at home without knowing how to use it because it comes with its own uh, dangers you know like oxygen is a um, highly combustible you know like suddenly if there is any short circuit or fire then it could make the fire worse so please do not um, routinely keep oxygen in your house. I would say that, you know, please go into a facility uh, where healthcare professionals can evaluate you and give oxygen if required. 
of course you know there are people who are on oxygen therapy long term those who previously have lung problems they have been educated on how to use it appropriately and they can continue to use but to initiate oxygen therapy by yourself is not something that i want to recommend i think it's 1 o'clock and uh, we are planning a 1 hour session i will uh, close the session and uh, hopefully meet you at a future day thank you all